Hi everybody, I'm Mary the beekeeper for Neshi Ka. We're here this morning in our bee yard in scenic Kfar Hanania in northern Israel. We're glad you could all join us and thanks for inviting us. Today we're going to talk about honey. We will give you a walking tour, not just through the apiary, but through our property and talk about some of the things that are in bloom. And then we'll go inside and we'll talk specifically about properties of honey. You guys know a lot more than I do about medicinal properties, but I can tell you what's in honey and we'll look at some different types of honey. Sorry you won't be able to taste them, but uh, take my word for it. They're all good. So again, thanks so much for having us this morning, uh, inviting us into your homes or hopefully outdoors. I had hoped to start with a walkabout around the property, but it is dumping rain, although the sun is peeking out here and there. When we have an opportunity, maybe we'll pop outside and get a chance uh, to, to look at what's going on with the, with the bees and with the, the flowers, the nectarious plants around the process. So strange as it may seem, I actually do have an agenda this morning. Again, we're really happy to be with you. Uh, we're going to talk about nectarious plants. You, again, are the plant experts, not me but we'll uh, talk about how honey is made and the properties of honey and uh, Rivka's already touched on some of those. Uh, there are lots of components to honey. We'll, we'll talk about as many of them as we possibly can. And really, I welcome your questions uh, throughout. Uh, and you've got to stay tuned till the very, very end because we're going to have a game. You're going to learn a lot about honey today, I hope. And we're going to have a game and winners will receive, you've got to score 80% on the quiz. Winners will receive one of our Beko Wax wraps. So I hope you stick around to the very end. Okay, so first let's touch briefly on how honey is actually made. Uh, I, I warn you, I could talk forever about bees. So I need to be very careful that we stay on topic as far as our honey subject matter goes. But, uh, so let's, we'll talk a little bit about bee biology. Bees have two stomachs. They have a, a honey stomach and a digestive stomach. Their honey, their honey stomach is where they store the nectar that they collect from the various nectarious plants. And in the process of collecting that nectar, they also perform a very essential pollination task. Uh, many many uh, nectarious plants and non-nectarious plants require uh, pollination in order to reproduce. And of course, we rely on the plants for all sorts of things. Uh, enough said, I think, about that. So, the plants rely on the bees, but the bees rely on the plants. The bees collect the nectar, they fill those two stomachs that I just referred to, and they take it back to the hive, and they store that nectar from their honey stomach in the individual cells inside the hive. Now, the nectar at that point usually has a 22% or higher water content. And that's based on the plant, the type of blossom that they're uh, foraging from. Uh, now, actual honey, raw honey, has to have a water content no more than 14% really to be viable. So we'll talk in a minute about how it gets down to that 14%. So once the bees have filled up cells with adequate nectar, remember it's, it's really loose at that point. I really wish I could show you a comb at this time. I can uh, attach a video later. It's very, very watery at that point. So how does it get to that optimum 7% uh, water content or moisture content in order to actually become honey? Well, the, the bees go as close as they can and they work in shifts and they flap their little wings and evaporate it. And once it's evaporated to the appropriate uh, moisture content, then they seal it with wax. And then you know you've got actual honey. Unfortunately, I think because of the weather, we won't be able to see any bees actually foraging on the blossoms but I think you get the general idea. Uh, you can also check out our YouTube channel and we've got lots of great bee porn there. Uh, pictures of bees doing their things. 
Okay, great question. Uh, reference uh, botulism and uh, feeding honey to infants. Now I have to be very careful here, full disclaimer. Uh, personally, I would not recommend, uh, I think the recommendation is don't feed honey to infants that are less than a year old. There are a variety of reasons why this has been accepted as a good practice in introducing honey to infants. Uh, but specifically, let's talk about um, 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 botulism. And this could actually apply to anybody. I wanted to include this picture because there was such a great discussion yesterday. Uh, we finished off, I think, talking about brassicas and there were some uh, questions about mustard. And I was so tickled, I went out in my garden, which we're getting ready for uh, the summer. and. Um, so on your right, you will see a picture of a brassica in blossom, and on the left, you'll see a mustard blossom. And they're similar, but not identical. Yes, a question. You said um, lactiferous, netiferous. I didn't catch it, but can you explain what this is, please? Okay, Rivka, great question. So it's nectiferous, the letter N at the beginning. And nectiferous are, nectiferous means plants that are uh, that produce a lot of nectar. Uh, most blossoming plants do produce nectar of one type or another, but some plants are more nectarious than others, and some plants bees don't like at all. Uh, so when I say nectarious, I'm talking about plants that are super bee friendly. Um, a lot of them in the in the family of the herbs and edibles where you guys specialize in. I've attached a picture from a great book I picked up at a seminar last year. Uh, it's published here in Israel and it's, it's the bound version is in English and Hebrew with lots of great pictures inside. Uh, it's about 150 pages long and it's spiral bound which is really great. Um, I have a shareable PDF of its contents but it's only the text and it's only Be'ivrit. It's only in Hebrew. Uh, at the end of this presentation, I've got a link to the library of the Volcani Agricultural Research Center uh, in the center of Israel, and you can inquire there. Uh, I tried to get some for the Ancient Roots Israel conference that, that we had, which was fantastic, by the way, and I uh, was unable to. But I can share the PDF in Hebrew if anyone's interested. Uh, some hospitals have even been known to treat wounds with it. Uh, there's a, a foundation here in Israel actually uh, founded, founded by a woman who received burns over I think 80% of her body and she was able to heal herself using honey. Uh, again, I'm not a specialist in medicinal uses of honey, but uh, I can send that link later on as well. Something that's important to keep in mind is any health benefits, at least that I'm going to discuss and you are probably most interested in, have, are specific to raw or unpasteurized honey. Uh, most honey you find in a grocery store is pasteurized. That means it's been heated to uh, a temperature of more than 63 degrees centigrade. And the high, they, they do that for a variety of reasons. Uh, it's not damning, uh, and it, it is necessary sometimes in huge honey production operations. So I just want to reinforce raw and unpasteurized honey has the most health benefits. And if you're really into trying raw honey, find your local beekeeper. I'll be happy to set you up with whomever you are, wherever you are. So a, a study investigating the effect of filtration and heating on specific types of honey uh, showed that processes such as high speed spinning heating and the addition of gas, sugar syrups, 
reduces enzyme activity, antioxidant content, and nutritional makeup of honey. So the quality of honey is seriously affected by the processing of it alone. So when we say raw, we mean unpasteurized, unheated, and with as little processing as you can possibly Let's talk about the health benefits of honey. So raw honey, as you mentioned earlier, it's been used as a folk remedy throughout history, and it's got lots of health benefits and medical uses even. Uh, some hospitals have even been known to treat wounds with it. Uh, there's a, a foundation here in Israel actually uh, founded founded by a woman who received burns over, I think, 80% of her body, and she was able to heal herself using honey. Uh, again, I'm not a specialist in medicinal uses of honey, but uh, I can send that link later on as well. Something that's important to keep in mind is any health benefits, at least that I'm going to discuss and you are probably most interested in, half are specific to raw or unpasteurized honey. Uh, most honey you find in a grocery store is pasteurized. That means it's been heated to uh, a temperature of more than 63 degrees centigrade. And the high, they, they do that for a variety of reasons. Uh, it's not damning, uh, and it it is necessary sometimes in huge honey production operations. So I just want to reinforce raw and unpasteurized honey has the most health benefits. And if you're really into trying raw honey, find your local beekeeper. I'll be happy to set you up with whomever you are, wherever you are. So a, a study investigating the effect of filtration and heating on specific types of honey uh, showed that processes such as high-speed spinning, heating, and the addition of uh, gas, sugar syrups, reduces enzyme activity, antioxidant content, and nutritional makeup of honey. So the quality of honey is seriously affected by the processing of it alone. So when we say raw, we mean unpasteurized, unheated, and with as little processing as you can possibly no, get away with. Make no doubt about it, it's, uh, it's, it's sweet. So 15 grams or one tablespoon of honey uh, has about 60 calories, uh, 17 grams of carbohydrates, and 16 grams of sugar. And sugar is various types of sugar, as I'm sure you're aware there are lots of different uh, terms that are used to describe sugars. Uh, it's got uh, amino acids and vitamins and minerals and enzymes. Like you never know what you're going to get is anybody that makes claims that their honey has this and this and this and this and this, like you'd see on a nutritional information on the, on the side of any packaged food product that you buy. In, in general terms, it's accurate. But if somebody says, you know, it's got five times the amount of vitamin B2 that you need in a single day, uh, either it's very, very expensive, or they're kind of guessing. Uh, and to actually, most people don't do that because it, it just leads to all sorts of inaccuracies. Whenever you see honey making fantastic claims, please be skeptical. Uh, know your beekeeper. I think that's the critical, the critical message here when it comes to nutrition and honey and quality. For the record, Honey may contain the following nutrients from 0.1 to as much as 1% of that, uh, sodium and potassium, calcium and magnesium, phosphorus and selenium, copper, zinc, and iron, manganese and chromium, B vitamins, vitamin C, and oh, one of my favorites, K. Uh, it also contains um, trace amounts of, of honey, like itty bitty teeny tiny pieces of honey or I'm sorry, of um, protein, I'm sorry, <laughs> protein, very little protein. We'll talk about protein in a minute. So raw honey and pasteurized honey can also carry harmful bacteria, such as um, the botulism bacteria. I think it's uh, clost Clostridium botulinum. Uh, it, it's particularly dangerous for babies. Uh, adults can handle it, babies cannot. That's one reason. 
Okay, raw honey should never be given to an infant less than a year old. That's standard practice, and any ethical beekeeper would tell you that. Uh, let's see, symptoms of botulism poisoning in infants, constipation, slow breathing, sagging eyelids, two, 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 um, absence of gagging, loss of head control, paralysis, poor feeding, lethargy, weak cry. Okay, um, so after that, that grisly list of, God forbid, you, you know, not not to have that uh, happen to anybody, let alone an infant. Uh, adults can offer also uh, experience the same symptoms. And uh, some people are allergic, and we'll talk about that in, in a little while. Uh, but more than likely, if you have a reaction ever from honey, it's because of botulism. And it's not that your honey is bad, it's just you may be especially sensitive to it. Um, another reason I've been told that it's not wise for babies, two reasons. One is it's, it's thick, it's very viscous, and it ca can cause them to choke. Uh, and the other reason is there, there are a lot of um, allergens in honey itself. And in reference to those allergens, there's probably a better technical name for what I'm discussing. Uh, it, you're probably familiar with a practice of, you know, if you are prone to seasonal allergies, for example, get some honey from your local beekeeper, raw honey, and take a spoon a day, and it will kind of inoculate you against whatever the uh, allergens are. Now we're talking about airborne allergens, obviously. Uh, but that's, they say that that has the opposite effect with infants and can actually make them more prone to those allergies. So again, I personally don't recommend it. Uh, it's an accepted best practice. Don't give it to infants. Uh, let's move on to, now this is where you want to take careful notes, because remember there's going to be a game at the end of this. We're going to talk about different types of honey and how you kind of tell them apart, if you can tell them apart. Okay, so if you look at this picture, these are there are 10 uh, shot glasses of various shapes, and each one contains 15 grams of honey. Probably. There is one um, imposter on the table. Uh, and uh, as you see, they are a variety of different colors. Uh, if you look carefully at the picture, you'll see, I'm sorry about the one dead center in the middle, uh, number five, because uh, I didn't have identical size shot glasses. Uh, but they all, if, if you can tell, the volume is ever so slightly different, each one of them. So, and I'm sorry you can't smell or taste them, but each one actually has a unique taste. So, back to honey. You see those different colors? You see those different volumes? Uh, I will tell you that they are all from Israel, and there is an imposter, but it is not alcoholic. It could look a little bit like brandy, I suppose, but uh, there is an imposter on the table. And again, what I referenced earlier about different honeys have different nutritional components because it's all based on what the bees forage on. So if you've got great organic nectarious plants in and around your, your vicinity, your bees are going to be happy and healthy and you'll get the very best honey from them. Now let's talk about those different colors. As you see, a couple stand out as being specifically much darker than others. It has to do, again, with what they foraged on. As you might imagine, citrus honeys tend to be very light in color and have a higher moisture content in them. Whereas other, other nectars, for example, uh, eucalyptus or acacia, uh, they're very, very, very sweet, but they're much darker. What a great question. Reference the flow hives. Uh, if, if, uh, if you buy honey, how do you know it's come from a flow hive? It, flow hives are fairly new in Israel, and they, I only know two other people that use them. It's not 
considered a financially viable way if you're a large honey producer to do business. It's really for boutique and independent honey producers. Beekeepers, you know, we, we tend to love each other. And at the same time, we can be very uh, proprietary about how we do things. I'm, I'm not one of them. I'm like, hey, <laughs> help me out here. You know, best practices come from, from sharing that sort of information. The flow hives themselves, the flow frames are expensive. So it represents a large investment on the part of the beekeeper to do that. So we use flow hives for that reason. And also because we employ special needs adults in various components of our business and the extraction is one of them. And given the nature of that in and of itself, just specifically for safety, that it makes the most sense. And there, I think there's some videos of that as well on our YouTube channel. Okay, so yes, chemical content does impact the color of honey. But if you think about it, and I'm sure, Rivka, you thought about this before you chose that as your answer. It's like anything else, it's, it's plant-based. It's plant-based. So what sort of soil are your plants growing in? Where do you live? What type of plant is it? Um, you, you described yesterday, you were talking about the mallows as uh, mucilage. Uh, you know, it's kind of um, slimy when you cook it, that sort of thing. So all of those properties of the plants impact the honey, not just its color, but its chemical properties and its taste and uh, the way it looks. Okay, what else do you think would impact the taste, nutritional value, uh, color, viscosity of honey? Okay, so while you're thinking about what might have the most impact, uh, sun, rain, or pesticide use, let's open up a really <clears throat> contentious can of worms and talk about organic honey. If you ever want to see a group of beekeepers get really, really upset with each other, just start talking about organic honey. Uh, the reason being is there's a lot of controversy around globally the term organic when it comes to any sort of ingestible product, uh, let alone honey. And here's why. So earlier we talked about how bees actually make honey. And since then, we've talked about what they forage on, how what they forage on impacts the quality and properties of that honey. But what we didn't talk about is the use of insecticides or pesticides. And that goes from stuff that might get sprayed on plants to environmental pollutants that just exist in our world today to applications that are actually made on seeds that are sold to home gardeners as well as commercial gardeners. What that really ties up into is that it's all part of the ecosystem. All of those are contributed to contributors to the ecosystem. Duh. Uh, I don't have a little leash on the bees. There are tens of thousands of them out there and they go wherever they want. Uh, and I can control maybe what we do in our own garden. And I can ask my neighbors politely not to spray. And actually the shoe is really, really good about letting us know when they're gonna spray so I can cover up the hives. Um, and that, that's good from a mortality perspective. It saves a lot of bees lives. But at the same time, they, the next day, they're going to go out and forage on those plants that, that got sprayed. Uh, it's a very, very, very difficult thing to define. There are indeed lab tests that can be done, and they're done in uh, several European countries that test the level of pollutants and uh, we'll call them uh, adulteration particles that happen just in raw honey, let alone in processed honey. Now the honey processing itself, even in a commercial setting, 
doesn't necessarily adulterate the honey or add inorganic things to them, although it can. Uh, but at the same time, there, there is really no such thing as organic honey. It just, we, we don't have control over where they go. And now that I've burst everybody's little organic bubble, I'm sorry, uh, please, please uh, patronize your local beekeepers whenever possible because having a relationship with your beekeeper is going to help you get the best honey you can possibly get for your family or for your medicinal uses, whether you're in it commercially or just privately. Uh, that's, that's, I think, the you know, resounding message from anything I've had to say today, specifically about honey. Now, there are all sorts of other things we could talk about. We could talk about beeswax. We can talk about other products of bees. And if you have any ideas or interest of anything uh, you think you might like to hear me talk about or, you know, going forward, send me a line. Let me know. And my favorite honey is, <clears throat> I'm going to say summer honey. Uh, something we're going to try this year. Uh, you see in the honey game that all those honeys have specific names. Because uh, depending on who the beekeeper is or the apiary, they're going to say, oh, well, you know, this is almond honey or this is clover honey. Again, you can't control where those bees go. And we have so much stuff in our area. This year we're going to try something new and just do like spring, summer, fall. There are typically three harvests here in Israel. Uh, so summer honey is my favorite. It's typically a little darker in color. The spring obviously is citrus and those are usually lighter. Um, and the fall is somewhere in between. So I'd say summer honey is my favorite because there's been the most variety of forage for the bees. It's tasty, tasty. So thanks again for joining us today. We loved having you and answering all your questions. Uh, make sure you please you follow us on YouTube, on Instagram, on oh, yeah, WhatsApp, on all sorts of social media. We're out there. Enjoyed sharing our outside space with you. Some of you are probably locked down in spaces uh, less prone to vitamin D exposure than most others. Uh, we have our great uh, view in the background of the orchards where our bees are happy pollinators as well as our yard right here. So we really appreciate being able to share this with you. So please share us with others that you know and we hope you stop by again. I can talk about these forever.